If you've been here the last several weeks, we've, we've been beginning with this certain mindset. It's our mission in, as the people of Jesus in the community of Caldwell isn't to make ourselves indispensable. It's to make Jesus irresistible. It's not about us. It's about making Jesus irresistible. At one point in our faith walk, he became irresistible. And we surrendered our will in our control over to him. And now he leads and guides us. And this ethic that that we as a uh, fellowship believe in and practice of love God, love others, and serve the world is so on display when we practice welcome and hospitality. When welcome and hospitality become our way of life, not just something that we do, not a program, but it's just part of who we are. And hospitality, as we've, we've talked very simply, is, is just making the other feel welcome. That our presence with people doesn't put them off, doesn't distract from the gospel either. And in the encounters that Jesus has with people, we see this so clearly. Even when he is speaking the truth to people in no uncertain terms, he does it in a way of such grace that even in his harshest confrontations, in his most uh, impolite moments, people still find him as irresistible. The woman at the well, he says, go get your husband. She says, well, I don't have any husbands. You remember that conversation? That was pretty direct. But she found him to be irresistible. When we enter into a a conversation that has a little edge to it or a little bit of confronting, how grace-filled are we in that moment? Is it about us getting our way or making sure that the truth is understood and people are, are really dealing with their junk? The same thing happened with Zacchaeus. Jesus confronted and after Jesus had been in Zacchaeus' home, Zacchaeus was all in. Even the calling of the disciples, just walking up to fishermen and saying, follow me. They found him irresistible. And for followers of Jesus, you know, people like us that, that are supposed to be finding ourselves more and more transformed into the image of him, this, this kind of grace and this way of living ought to really... Uh, be at the heart of who we are. Grace travels well. Welcome and hospitality wasn't just something Jesus did from home because, you know, he didn't have a home. He stayed with people. But even as he's staying with other people, he's making people feel welcome wherever he is. And they feel like they found a friend everywhere he went. And for a couple more weeks, we're going to keep looking at this this uncomplicated but uh, strangely overlooked facet of our faith. It's always easier to invite a friend to lunch than a stranger, isn't it? Always. It's always easier to have a friend in our home than somebody that we've ever never met before. It's always easier to have a conversation with people whose politics align with our own rather than those whose politics are different than ours or the way we see the world. But it never seems to be a problem for Jesus, does it? Never. Everyone was welcome. The religious, the irreligious, the holy, the people with demons, even the oppressor, even the Roman centurions that he dealt with. And as followers of Jesus in this increasingly divided world, we have really got to work hard and really have to have our eyes open to the lure of finding ourselves with the mindset of us versus them. to give the world an us or them context. And we have to strive to continually cultivate our capacity to genuinely welcome people. 
to accept them as we find them. But this is not an effortless task. It takes work. Now, as a culture, Israel was defined by its hospitality. They were all about hospitality, both in scripture and in the writings and commentaries of the, the ancient Jewish rabbis. The importance of hospitality was taught in the strongest terms. It was enforced to the rabbis, uh, for example, taught that in Jerusalem, in the city of Jerusalem, no man was to assume that his house was his only. It also exists for, for the guest and for the stranger. They also noted that during times of religious feasts, no pilgrim ever arrived for the celebration without receiving a gracious reception. There was a mint on the pillow. There was a gift basket. The Hebrew people were, were taught the ethic of expectation. No guest is ever a surprise. No visitor is ever unwelcome. So that's, that's what they had been taught. That was a fundamental for them. The ethic of expectation, everyone is welcome. And there's this fabulous uh, Jewish historian from the uh, 19th century named Alfred Edelsheim, Eldersheim. And I've got a couple of his books, and they are just fascinating. And this is from his book. He said, some rabbis went so far as to suggest there should be four doors to every house to bid welcome to travelers from all directions. In Jerusalem, it seems to have been the custom to hang a curtain in the front door to indicate there was still room for guests. In fact, just a, a few miles outside the city of Jerusalem, he says this, the towns of Bethany and Bethphage were especially celebrated for their over-the-top hospitality toward pilgrims arriving for the feasts and festivals. The hosts would go to meet an expected guest and again accompany him part of the way. Not only was your door open, but you would go down the road and greet them. And I wonder if this is part of the, the reason that Jesus includes in his story the prodigal son. What does the father do? He runs down the road of course, this is his son, but it speaks to this kind of practice. He runs down the road and accompanies his son to the home. Now, in the gospel accounts, do you recall uh, some friends of Jesus who, who happened to live in this hotbed of hospitality? Who lived in Bethany? Well, you will in a second. In the story that both John and Luke recount, there's this incident where, of all things, this kind of over the the top um, hospitality and this, this graciousness and welcome has led to, uh, of all things, it, it's led to a subtle form of idolatry. An idol is anything that, anything or, or anyone or whatever comes in place or, or steals our affection from what's more important or most important. Now in Luke chapter 10, he, he recounts it this way. He said, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village, and the village is Bethany, where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She opened her home to him. So Jesus is traveling, got his 12 besties with him. If this had been an expected visit, according to what historians tell us, she would have met him on the road. So th this this might be one of these things where all of a sudden you have 13 guests for dinner. And it's all happened to us, right? So nevertheless, she opens her home. Next verse. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. And I was thinking this week, we always assume that Mary is the little sister, don't we? I guess it's because the, the oldest sister is usually the most productive and the most, well, I, let me rephrase that more responsible party. That's what I assume anyway. It doesn't say that in the text, but it's the way I've always read the story. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Thirteen uninvited, unexpected guests, but we always expect guests, so what, what do we do now? 
So it, it does suggest that Jesus and his disciples just kind of dropped by. Otherwise, I mean, she would have been prepared. She would have had the spread laid out. She would have had the accommodations handled in advance. She would, would have met him on the road. And it's his same Martha. When her brother Lazarus had died, went out to meet Jesus on the road and accompany him back. That was her practice. This is who she is. So Martha came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Jesus may have thought, don't put me in the middle of this. But he doesn't say it. The Marthas of our world are, are bent towards service and place. Martha is probably one of those tireless workers. She probably, in addition to all her work, she probably volunteers somewhere. She's, she is a coordinator. She's detail-oriented, a type A person. Has the gift of administration. And welcoming. And hospitality. It's, it's not only her duty as keeper of the home, it's, it's also... Hey, it's fundamental to my religion. It's part of our Jewish distinctive. And even in this town that I live in, this is what my town is known for, this hospitality. And I need help. It's our civic identity. It's our tradition. And I, I'm doing it myself. I need help. And in her own eyes, Martha probably sees that this is where she is of most value. I understand needs. I understand the expectation of hospitality that my culture values so highly. But along with those things that our culture values and a lot of the expectations that we labor under comes a weight of responsibility. How often have you been hamstrung or set things aside because of somebody else's expectation that this is your responsibility. Happens a lot. Luke says, Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. What's a distraction? It's that thing that deflects your attention from what's more important, right? So Martha knows. She knows the expectation. She knows the pressure of responsibility, and expectation of her culture, her religious tradition. We, we understand that. We get her. Every one of us really want to present a spotless home and a wonderful meal, don't we? We do. How do we handle it when 13 people show up? And her friend Jesus understands this too. But he understands things also from, from a different kind of lens. He, he sees things on a much deeper level. He says, Martha, Martha. And it, as I've been thinking about this, imagine that Martha who is so distraught, so upset, that to get her attention, he has to say it twice. Martha. Martha. The Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. He didn't compound her self-doubt. He says, I understand. I understand. And he doesn't really let her self-criticism self to go on. He doesn't let her list her failures. Jesus didn't come to her home for the white glove treatment. Jesus, there's nothing in Scripture that tells us that Jesus counted the dust bunnies in her home. 
It doesn't say that he rolled his eyes at the stack of dishes in her sink. He gave her grace, he gave her understanding, he gave her assurance. And then he gives her the truth. He says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but in reality, Martha, few things are needed, or indeed only one. Martha, you, you are so concerned about place. Let's be concerned about presence for a moment. The issue isn't the, the, the quality of the accommodations or the food that you're about to serve. The issue is choosing what is more important in this moment. Is it this place or is it my presence? And he says, Mary has chosen what is better and, what, and it will not be taken away from her. In this moment, Martha, Mary has chosen the better thing. Why would I send her to the kitchen? when the things that will last are out here. Sometimes it's hard to get out of our own way when it comes to welcome and hospitality. When we welcome, when we look people in the eye, when we spend time in their company, this is the hard reality that we overlook. They will forget the meal. They will forget the dessert. They will forget your shedding dog and the cat hair on the cushions. They will forget that. They will forget the cobwebs that as you sit there having a nice pleasant talk, you see waving in the, you know. They'll forget that. And no matter what you believe, they have not come to inspect your bathroom. They haven't. What is it that your guest will not forget? Because they will always remember the more important and the more eternal. And that's what happens in the present. You. They will remember you. They will remember us. They will remember your encouragement. They will remember the hope that we offer. They will remember the help that, that we give. Out of glad hearts. In a couple of weeks, reality is that people will have forgotten all about Compassion Caldwell. They will have forgotten all about the delicious chicken sandwiches. They will have uh, forgotten about getting a flu shot. The hair that they just had cut yesterday is going to grow back. Present company excluded. Um, all the things that we did won't be a vivid memory. They'll be a memory. They won't be vivid. What will be vivid? The conversations that we have. The hope that we may offer. The community that is shared. And that's fine. They'll forget the clothes. They'll forget the shampoo. They'll forget the barbecue. They will forget a lot of things. But they will never forget our conversations with them. They will never forget that we looked them in the eye. They will never forget that we treated them with dignity and respect. The other things are helpful, but they're also very forgettable. Our new uh, conference superintendent, Dr. Uh, Michael Trailer, put this in his uh, monthly article, and I asked him if I could use it. He said, okay. And this is a, a portion of his... Uh, of his essay. He said the Zulu tribe greets using the word sawubona. It literally, me literally means I see you. It does not mean that I simply visually see you, but that I comprehend that you are a person of dignity and value. Study after, after study has affirmed that the poor and disadvantaged often feel not only powerless, but 
invisible. Our ministry begins with seeing others made in the image of God. That's where it begins. Not what car they drive, not what their bank account looks like. Not the friends that they have that we wish we had. He goes on to say, in order to see, you must slow down and be willing to be interrupted. Are you willing to be interrupted? In fact, reflecting on Jesus' ministry, particularly as shared by the Gospel of Mark, was a ministry built upon interruptions. When was the last time you understood your interruption as a holy interruption? That's important to us. That's important to us. It's why we do the community supper. It's not about feeding them. They will forget the meal. What they won't forget is the interchange that they have with Dwayne and Lynette and Steve and Mary Ann or Kelly and Julie or Michelle and Leland. That's what they don't forget. And that's the connection that we are trying to make. That we don't look past people. That we comprehend that they are a person of dignity and value. And we touched on this in Sunday school this morning. Not ironically and not coincidentally. What is never forgotten, what is never forgotten, for good or for bad, is how a Christian treats another person. How they were made to feel. The kind of welcome they found, or, or worse, didn't find. The respect and the kindness. The eye contact. The simple things. The simple things. I'm proud of you guys. We do this well. And we could do it better. So when the opportunities come for a community supper, as much as possible, this is the in intersection of our faith and our culture, faith and society, how we welcome the other, how we treat them. How will we be remembered? How will they remember us? Let's pray. The king will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these you did not do for me. God, God, we need to understand your heart. And in particular, Father, we need to know what breaks your heart. Father God, what makes you cry? What makes you cry? What makes you weep? Is it the fact that we just walk past the folks that, that Jesus is describing here? That we can't even make eye contact or offer a smile or an encouraging word? What is it, God, that makes you weep? What breaks your heart? God, we are asking you to teach us this because we need to know. Father, in this humble church, we certainly don't see ourselves as people of wealth and people of privilege. God, if that spirit exists here, God, we ask that you would break it. That 
you would take it away. God, we would much rather know what breaks your heart. We would rather know, Father. We would rather know that we've done all that we can for the least of these. We pray, Father. We repent. God, for the number of times when we have walked past situations, we repent of the times when our welcome was fake. We repent of the times when we saw people as interruptions. And Father, we can uh, we can justify a lot of things. We can say, well, we were very busy at the moment. Or we were under a lot of stress. Or we were just having a bad day. But God, I pray that you would take that mindset away with us and fill us with such a measure of grace. So transform our nature and our character, God, that uh, we see every interruption as a holy interruption. God, I pray for a, a breakthrough year when it comes to the relationships that are built in our church with people that don't go to our church. Father, that Jesus would be so evident in our lives that he becomes irresistible. We pray that strangers would know that we love them. That somebody truly shares their human concerns. Father, so we ask that you put people in our path. We, we ask that you would challenge us. Again, Father, teach us what breaks your heart. Teach us what makes you cry. Father, if, if it's an attitude of pride that we carry, Father, we ask that you would reveal that to each one of us. Help us to shed that, to cast it aside. Father, as we come to this table that represents such a sacrifice for those you loved and really weren't worthy Father, we stand in uh, profound thanks. We acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, Savior, and King, and that it's by his broken body and his shed blood, not of any goodness of our own, any achievement of our own, but by his broken body and shed blood, that we can be set free. Father, as we come to this table, as we receive the elements with joy, Father, sink truth into our lives and into our hearts. Thank you for the, uh, the event yesterday. Thank you for the many hands of our church that were there and participating. Thank you for everybody that came. Thank you, Father, for giving us the opportunity to serve. For all these great things, Father, we give you the honor and the praise. We pray all these things in Jesus' name.